right, I'm back. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for being patient. Um, so I introduce myself. I'm from Convoy, blah, blah, blah. All right. So um, what I'm sure everybody here has heard, maybe if you're on LinkedIn, maybe if you're on Twitter, how much excitement there is in this space of generative AI, LLMs, chat GPT is coming for our jobs, all of these things. And this is a quote that I actually saw from a venture capitalist named Tomas Tongus. And he says, and I'm just going to read this, AI will automate 25 to 50% of white collar work, including data analysis. Will data teams shrink in size? On the contrary, while AI can automate some work, it will also demand much more from data teams. I tend to agree with this. However, that doesn't stop the AI evangelists from making extraordinary claims without extraordinary evidence of what LLMs are capable of doing. What I hear a lot of folks imagine is that if you ask an LLM any question, you'll get an answer about the business. Well, that sounds really exciting, and that would basically mean bye-bye analysts, right? They also believe that you can ask the LLM to make any prediction, and you will get a predictive model as an output, and that means bye-bye data scientists. And they also believe that eventually you'll be able to ask the LLM to discover bottlenecks and business opportunities through the data, and that means bye-bye product teams, which seems a bit dire. But I'm preaching to the choir here. All of us have data engineering backgrounds, and we know one fundamental truth about using data for any model, and that's that good, a good AI requires good data, and most of the data is terrible. <laughs> we are a long, long way away from any of these um, future predictions from coming true. But it's important for us to understand how far away we are and what we actually need to do to get there. So Andrew Ng is a really, really smart guy. He was one of the pioneers of the term MLOps. He was a founder of Coursera. And what he said was that MLOps' most important task is to make high quality data available through all stages of the ML project lifecycle. And for the past 10 years, most data science teams have been treating machine learning and artificial intelligence as an act of model building and not necessarily as an act of defining both the model and the data with equal levels of intensity. So what happens to our AI systems if the data quality is poor? Well, number one, you may make wrong predictions. And these can be relatively minor incorrect predictions, like if you have a recommendation system for an e-commerce company, you could recommend products that that particular customer has no interest in. So worst case scenario, maybe they, they get kind of irritated with your business and say, I'm being shown irrelevant items. But on the far end of that, in terms of problematic behavior, there are some companies that use artificial intelligence in order to predict a person's credit worthiness in order to get a loan for a house. A data quality issue there has a way bigger and deeper implication. Second, the model may stop working, it's an outage. Sometimes the schema might change in such a way that the model doesn't know how to process it, and it could break. At Convoy, machine learning was in our DNA, and sometimes we would get outages. In fact, at one point in our history, when data quality was exceptionally bad, we were getting outages basically every month, and this was costing us millions of dollars in lost revenue. And then finally, in the world of LLMs and ChatGPT, you also get hallucinations. And if you're not familiar with the term hallucination, it essentially means that your model is making a confident but incorrect statement. Now, LLMs are naturally inclined to hallucinate due to the way that they are built, but if you feed that LLM bad data, the likelihood of it hallucinating goes up by an order of magnitude. So why is the data quality so low and why is this such a difficult problem to solve? Well, number one, most teams' data infrastructure looks something like this, right? You've got so many source systems that were defined over a very long period of time, feeding into data lakes, feeding into Kafka topics, which ultimately feed into some type of analytical environment Maybe it's Snowflake, maybe it's Redshift, and maybe the data goes somewhere else. Maybe you've got some PySpark stuff running. It's all over the place. It's not clear who actually owns any of this, 
And it's hard to say how much of it has actually been maintained and for how long. Any of it could break at any point in time. And if some random data engineer who's been with the company for 10 years decides to leave, all of this institutional knowledge goes with them. That's not good. The other issue is replication. You have the same data being defined all over the business. So here's a very common example of this that I've seen before, where you might have a data scientist that wants to leverage active account information to understand how many customers are using their platform right now. Now, where might they get this data from? Well, maybe we have a few different microservices, and in each one of those microservices, we're generating some slightly different data. We've got a microservice that defines free account information, an active customers database, an active accounts database, which produces an active customers table, a customer active table, which leverages data from active customers and free accounts, and a customer's churn table that uses the churn customer data. Where is the right place for me to find the active customer information? Well, what actually happens is most data scientists, they just make a selection either based on their intuition or talking to one or more of the software engineers. And if they're wrong, well, it's hard to say. The world just kind of keeps on spinning. The next problem is that data is changing all the time. Production systems are actively changing and being updated. New columns are being added, schemas are being changed, columns are being dropped, new tables are being added using whatever data modeling tool you want to use. And all of these questions here start coming into play, right? What did the data used to mean before it changed? When did it change? Who changed it? Why did it change? What impact did it have on the semantics of the data? And was the change good for me or bad for me? Very infrequently is any of this actually documented. Now you imagine this changing system is sitting on top of a bunch of replicated data that in and of itself is a part of an extremely complex ecosystem with thousands of data models and tons of spaghetti code. This is why any time a business announces that they are moving to generative AI, you get two different responses. Data scientists are very excited. More modeling, exciting modeling, breaking news. It's really cool to be able to experiment with LLMs. But data engineers have to deal with all the mess that I just described. So if you feel this, if you had any amount of empathy for any of the problems that I just spoke about, you're actually not alone. I have talked to hundreds of data engineering and data platform teams over the past year. And what I can tell you is that all of them care about data quality. In fact, more than 75% actually say that data quality is the number one investment that their data team needs to be making over the next six months. But the percent of those teams that actually believe that their data is trustworthy is unbelievably low. So something is obviously wrong here, right? If everybody wants data quality and they all care about it, but they're not getting it, there's, there's a mismatch in our expectations and what we're investing in. So what are the root causes of this low data quality? Well, the first is that we have very little ownership. Most of the source data in a company that is being leveraged for AI was defined for a totally different reason. Typically, transactional systems are supporting um, some operational use case or some application. And it's very, very hard to then go back after the fact and talk to an engineer and say, hey, I've been using your data for this AI thing that I've been building, and I need you to start taking me seriously. I need you to start thinking about my data as being just as important as your application. But nobody ever asked them to do that until the data scientist did. So of course, they don't treat it seriously. Secondly, there's no awareness from the production system to the analytical system. Software engineers don't know who's using their data. They don't know where it's going. They don't know how it's being used in analysis. They don't know whether those use cases are meaningful or not. And they don't know what's going to happen to those downstream users if something changes. So without this information, they have no agency. They're not able to make decisions that benefit the business. Thirdly, there's no change management. When things change, there is no communication between the data producer and the data consumer. Now, sometimes there is an attempt, but in my experience, this is usually a pretty poor attempt. Those messages don't re usually re uh, reach the right people. 
And often, the languages themselves are different. So a change that's made in JavaScript, an analyst who writes SQL is not going to understand how it will impact them. And then finally, there's no semantic truth. So as the meaning of tables and dashboards and databases change, the semantic truth changes along with it. And it's not clear how the underlying meaning of these data assets evolves over time. Just because I'm using a data today, using some data today, and I think I understand it, doesn't mean that a month from now it's going to mean the same thing. In the data world, we call this problem garbage in, garbage out. Once you have low quality data that comes into a system, then the problem has already occurred, right? Now you're just dealing with it. And data engineers and analysts and data scientists usually deal with it by writing filters, writing case statements on top of their queries, by doing backfilling jobs. But this is all just tech debt. The problem has occurred, it's just a question of how high is the tech debt going to pile up before the whole system implodes. All right, so let's talk solutions. We've talked problems long enough, I think. Um, conventional solutions are actually not an answer for a few reasons. First, you've got tools used for cataloging and indexing all of your data, like data catalogs. And you've got monitoring tools for figuring out when something has changed or has broken. And these are great. And I strongly recommend that if you don't have a data catalog in place, or if you have no monitoring and system in place, then you should go and get that because it's really essential. However, all of these things are reactive, right? By the time they tell you that something has happened, it's already happened, garbage in, garbage out. It's occurred too late. Now, many businesses have invested in preventative mechanisms that are designed to cut the problem off before it occurs. Governance committees are one example of this. So this would be when maybe a data engineering leader or the data governance leader goes and talks to a bunch of software engineers and data engineers and product managers and gets them to join a group. And they all together decide, well, what is the right way for us to treat our data at the company? This is pretty common. And again, I think this is a great thing and everyone should do it. The problem is it's very, very slow. It is hard to generate enough organi organizational momentum from that group to see change across the business, right? Especially in modern tech companies where software engineers are encouraged to deploy every day as fast as possible. The other thing I've seen is really just having data engineers sit in every single meeting where a new feature is being introduced. This works, it actually works tremendously well. Um, one category of businesses that doesn't have that many data quality problems is early stage startups. And the reason why is, there's, a, there's few enough software engineers at the company that the data engineers actually can pay attention to every feature release and represent the data. The issue is that this does not scale. And that's because the ratio of data engineers to software engineers at a company grows very, very quickly. It grows from one to five, to one to 10, to one to 20. And when you have hundreds or even thousands of software engineers to five to 10 data engineers, we're just not capable of being everywhere at once. So what are the requirements of a solution? Well, hopefully I've illustrated that. You need something preventative. You have to be able to stop the problem before it happens. It needs to be fast to keep up with your modern software engineering team, and it also needs to be scalable. In comes the data contract. So before we talk about what a data contract is and how it can be implemented, the thing I really want everybody to think about as we're going through this part of the presentation is that the purpose of data contracts is not to be a wall between the data producer and the data consumer preventing changes from being made. It's a feedback loop. It helps create awareness and visibility and communication between two groups in a company that normally do not talk to each other. So what is a data contract? It's an API for all intents and purposes. So it is an agreement between a data consumer and a data producer about the expectations on a particular data resource that allows the data consumer to do their jobs without things suddenly breaking without their knowledge. There's three core elements to a data contract, the schema of the data, the semantics, and the SLAs. And there's an example there to the right. But this is not extensive. I've seen teams that were using PII data in their contracts, and some teams that had very complex constraints in addition to the ones that I just mentioned. Data contracts need to be enforceable. A contract without enforcement is just documentation. 
And an enforcement without a contract is just a test. When you pair the two together, that's when you get something that's actually greater than the sum of its parts. The system that I recommend is that a data producer or software engineer submits a PR. The contract is validated before the change is deployed. And you produce an alert in that PR that lets the software engineer understand what it is they're going to be breaking and who will be impacted. I think in general there's two different types of alerts that you can produce. These are informational alerts and blocking changes. Informational is helping the data producer understand how data is being leveraged downstream and bringing the consumers of data into the loop. And blocking change is exactly what it sounds like. It's not letting the, uh, uh, it's, it's breaking the build. So when we're talking about the informational step, this is really about ensuring that the right people are informed at the right time with the right information that's most useful to them. The data producer needs to know what it is they're going to be impacting. Now software engineers are risk mitigators. This is their job. The thing that they care about most is not breaking others. And a pull request is literally the act of asking for feedback. And so if you can provide feedback at that point in time that says, hey, you're gonna be breaking a dashboard that the CFO uses every week to make major company decisions, the likelihood that they will continue to push through that change is almost zero. The data engineer has the ability to advocate for the pipeline. They understand where the data comes from and where it's flowing. The data consumer, perhaps most of all, wants to be in the loop with this change because that analyst is the person who will be presenting to the CFO. They don't want to wake up tomorrow morning due to a change that they knew was coming which broke them and say, hey, look, I knew that this thing was coming and your dashboard is broken, now I have to bear the responsibility of that. If you can align the incentives of these three groups, change will happen. Awareness creates culture change. Once there is visibility into the system and once each stakeholder has an incentive to act, this is how you create greater data literacy in an organic, iterative way. The other benefit of data contracts is that it allows the business to know what data is trustworthy. So if you think back to the spaghetti world where you have tons of data everywhere, it's not clear what that data is, who it's being used by, and whether or not you can trust it. You have thousand line SQL files that are totally imparsable. What an analyst or a data scientist will do is instead of using that totally imparsable SQL, they'll go back to the engineers, go back to the source, ask them what the data means, and recreate the query themselves in a way they can understand it. Data contracts eliminate that because now you have a trustworthy source of truth with clearly defined constraints and semantics about what the data means. So what do you solve with data contracts? Number one, you have change management and change communication in place for 100% of the data assets that matter to your consumers. Number two, ownership is clearly defined at the producer level. Number three, you have the ability to prevent breaking changes to important data before they occur. Number four, you have trustworthy data assets that the business can actually rely on instead of constantly uh, rebuilding the wheel over and over again. Number five, there is awareness from the producer side into how data is flowing throughout the company. Number six, it helps your AI systems make trustworthy decisions. Number seven, it allows the data engineering team to scale by redirecting their efforts to the places that it matters. All right, so let's talk implementation. The data contract is composed of two parts, two parts, the spec and the enforcement mechanism. Let's go through the spec first. I believe that the best way to implement a spec for a data contract is leveraging YAML. The reason I like YAML a lot is because it is unbelievably flexible, and I think the best system for data contracts relies on being able to translate the constraints in a YAML file into checks in CICD. YAML is really great for this. But you can use anything like JSON schema also works when getting started. Some of the constraints or some of the values that you want to lay out in your contracts include the name of the resource. There should be a one-to-one -one mapping between the resource name and the contract. Number two, the owner of the contract. 
the schema that needs to be under enforcement, data types, and also a tiering system. I like building my tiering system between 0 and 2, 0, 1, 2. And that tiering system indicates the action, that the enforcement action that must be taken when a contract is violated. So tier zero data contracts just immediately break the build. Tier one data contracts inform both the producer and the consumer, and tier two data contracts just inform the consumer. Not everything needs to be a breaking change. Here's an example of a contract. You can see it contains all the properties that I just mentioned the actual description of the, what the contract is, the owner. This can be a team in GitHub or it can be an individual. The data types, the schemas, and so on and so forth. Next, let's talk about the enforcement mechanism. Oh, and because I forgot, generally you wanna take those contracts and you wanna put them into a Git repo so they're version controlled. Hopefully that was obvious. Um, next, as I mentioned, is the mechanism of enforcement. So the way that your CICD check works is, at least this is how we did it at Convoy, we were comparing the output of a data migration in a developer environment to what was stored in the contract. So we had a GitHub action that would essentially perform this. And then depending on the backwards compatibility of the new version of the data, that is when we would trigger either the breaking change or the information. So a few of the things worth considering about this process is that, um, and again, this is really gonna depend on the organization, but at Convoy, it was actually the data engineers that were enabled and empowered to add these CICD checks themselves. And that was because we presented it very similar to how a security team might present a similar check, right? We want to monitor changes to our core code base um, our security team had CICD checks that would run against Docker files and, ins and ensure that all of our security uh, best practices were being followed. And we presented it the exact same way. We need to know during CICD as a data team when something is gonna break our consumers. And then we had our data engineering team analyze our internal, uh, analyze our data lineage, figure out what our sort of tier zero production systems were, and then put the data contracts there. Now. Obviously, CICD is great where you can enforce it. If you have an upstream source that doesn't expose CICD, like maybe a third-party SaaS tool like Salesforce or HubSpot or something like that, there are also mechanisms to do that. Um, there are also mechanisms to be preventative. I didn't include them in this presentation, but if you're interested in how to do that, you can come and find me and talk to me afterwards. So here's an example of what an, uh, an, an error message that we are popping at Convoy looked like. Change to this PR has altered the schema of a data asset that is under contract. Here's the owner of the contract and you should go and contact them. And here's the actual uh, missing property that should be included. Now this is very, very basic. This is where we started. We eventually added a lot more information to this error message and we would actually tag the consumers of data contracts in the PRs themselves so the data scientists could go and advocate we also had a me mechanism where we were surfacing contracts through a small UI, and in that UI, a data consumer could actually subscribe to contracts that they cared about, and this would automatically tag them on the PRs as well. So in terms of making updates to the contract and evolving them over time, you are not gonna be able to plan every single constraint in advance, and I don't recommend that you do so. But every if you store these contracts in Git, then every update that you make is a PR. So when you modify the contract, it is a review between the producer and the consumer. If you have evidence of why that constraint should exist, generally I found that the producers are um, very amenable towards that. Okay, next, where should you implement data contracts in the pipeline? I believe that the contract should be enforced vertically, not horizontally. There's a few reasons for that. The first is, like I mentioned, not everything deserves to be a breaking change. If you implement contracts everywhere, it actually ends up slowing down your engineering team. You don't want them to have to consider every single change that they make to a database or other source system if it doesn't negatively, infect someone, uh, negatively affect someone downstream of them. The goal here is to start off by protecting the business critical assets. So that includes AI, that includes any sort of accounting data, um, 
at Convoy, we had customer data that, that we were generating in our uh, Snowflake instance. So we had views, we would push those views out to a React application, and then from there, our uh, shipping partners would look at those. That was really, really important data, and we wanted to put that under contract first. Now, I mentioned before that catalogs and monitoring systems don't totally solve this problem, but they actually do have a pretty big part to play in the data contract-oriented ecosystem. Um, you can surface the contract metadata in your catalog pretty simply. In fact, we were doing this with an open source catalog called Amundsen. And in Amundsen, you can s scan all of your data assets in Snowflake. And all we were saying was, hey, here are the data assets in Snowflake that are under protection from a contract. So our data consumers would know, you know where they could take a dependency and where they couldn't. You can also enrich the various assets in a, contract, uh, in a catalog with information about the contract, including violations, change logs, things like that. And when you're talking about monitoring, the way that I like to integrate monitoring into a data contracting system is monitoring is really for detecting the unknown unknowns. So it's the changes that we don't know are going to happen before they have an impact on us. And once we understand which validation rule was breached, we can now incorporate that back into the construct in a preventative way with evidence, right? So I can go to my producer and I can say, hey, we've just had this violation downstream. Here's the impact that it had on us. I would like to add it as a constraint into my contract now. So this is a really common question that I get anytime I talk about data contracts, which is, don't you need to change the culture first? Like, don't you need to have a culture change in the business before you even think about implementation? And I think, I always like asking this question, which is a bit of a reframing. And it's, if you, you know, Agile is a very common working model today. A lot of engineering teams are essentially doing it from day one. But if you went to a company and you wanted to implement Agile, and no one had ever heard of it before, would you either, A, start off by introducing the Agile manifesto to every software engineering team and sitting down with them saying, we're going to read the Agile manifesto, and we're going to get everybody to agree with it, and we're all going to believe in it, and then we're going to go out and implement it? Or would you start by giving the engineering team systems that make their life better, version control, CI, CD, GitHub, Jira, and so on and so forth. Well, the difference between these two approaches is that the first creates process and the second creates value. The reason that version control, CI, CD, GitHub, and Jira are so well adopted is because they make the data producer's life better. They want to adopt these things, right? When you're shipping code, if you don't have the ability to easily roll it back, that sucks. That's not good, right? If you want an automated system of telling you when you're breaking something so you don't have to find it out manually, that's good. And if you start to use all of these systems in a framework, effectively, you are doing Agile. It becomes far easier to layer process on top of a system that is already functional than going in and trying to implement process from zero. So, the way that I like to frame it is once it is easy to do the right thing, then the right culture can be layered on top. If it is hard to do the right thing or painful, it is almost impossible to layer culture on top. Data contracts make the transition to produce your own data quality easy. That's the takeaway that I want all of you to have from this presentation. The contracts can be implemented by the data engineers, which is the team that has the problem. They allow the consumers to self-advocate when something is about to break, and it creates visibility for the data producers, giving them awareness into how their data is being used downstream. There is value for every single stakeholder in the data production pipeline. That's my presentation. I hope it was useful. I don't know exactly how much time I have. I have five minutes, so I'm happy to take questions for five minutes. Um, but thank you. That's it.